Good evening. I would like to call to order the April 16th, 2018 Lake Washington School Board meeting. Before we go any further, I'd just like to let you know that this projector currently is not working. So on that side, you will be able to see what is happening. We are recording everything, but unfortunately this one isn't currently working. And, of course, and we can all see board members. And we can see it all right here, luckily. So, because I couldn't see that board. All right, so for the first thing, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the April 16th agenda. Uh, so moved. Second. It has been moved by Director La Liberty and seconded by Director Carlson that we approve the agenda. All those in favor, please signify by voting aye. 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 Here, all those opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. And then we'd like to move to our host school. Dr. Pierce, will you introduce our host school this evening? I am very happy to introduce our host school. So uh, our host school this evening is Kirk Elementary, and Monica Garcia is principal of Kirk Elementary, and she's here to get us started and introduce our team. <laughs> I'm going to wear the readers just so I actually see. Is so, your microphone on, Monica? What was that? Do we have your microphone on? Is the microphone on? Yes. OK. Thank you. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the board and Dr. Pierce, thank you very much for the opportunity to share with you about a community that is near and dear to my heart. I'm Monica, the school principal, and with me is my trusty sidekick, Ian Maver. He's our associate principal at Peter Kirk. Over the next several minutes, I'm going to share a picture of what Peter Kirk is and who we are as a building. I'll share with you our vision of student learning and success as well as provide an update on our continuous improvement activities and provide a peek behind the data curtain to get a full insight into who we are as Peter Kirk. We are uh, parked in the heart of the Kirkland community, located between 405 and Lake Washington. Our building is secluded. It's tucked away and surrounded by greenery. The layout of our current building uh, faces inward, so there's a real sense of purpose and common shared belonging. We're also the heart of our community. We are primarily a walking school with only one bus serving students who live west of Market. The people who attend Peter Kirk live very nearby and ac access the school grounds on the weekends and in the evenings. Visit Peter Kirk before school and after school and you'll notice the sizable number of parents who linger outside just kind of chatting and connecting with each other. Visit during school hours and you'll note the number of parent volunteers on deck working as, with individuals and with small groups of students on reading skills and math fluency. Note as well the number of parents who dedicate their time presenting art lessons as docents and as artists in residence. I often share the story of my first week, weeks at Peter Kirk. Uh, as the newest member of the crew, I couldn't figure out who actually worked there as an employee and who was a volunteer. Uh, there were so many people there who had purpose and they were doing meaningful work with kids. They were all wearing badges. Um, it really was hard for me as the newbie to figure out, okay, are you an employee? So I just had to learn everybody's names. This partnership was and continues to be simply kind of the natural way of being at Peter Kirk. When selected to serve as the Peter Kirk principal, I met with individual staff members to just listen and learn. I began to hear key words and phrases surface over and over and over again. And uh, what began to, what surfaced were the ideas of community, collaboration, and creativity. This word cloud was created using those initial notes uh, from those meetings. The next word cloud was created last spring as part of our building design process, and you'll note that there's some overlap. The same ideas of creativity, community, and collaboration come through in the work that we do with our community as well. Parents, members of our local community, grandparents, classified and certificated staff, administrator, and students are in this together. Collectively, we're committed to the well-being and success of all who work and learn at Peter Kirk Elementary. Because we value community, collaboration, and creativity, a visitor will experience a warm welcome and a shared sense of pride in our students and in their success. Uh, students who attend Peter Kirk can expect to be met where they are. They can be, expect to be challenged beyond their immediate and self-perceived limits. And they can feel the comfort and commitment of each adult who either volunteers or works within the building. They also find interesting paths to explore. There's all kinds of opportunities through our before and after school program and the interests of teachers and parents are brought into the school throughout the day. Families can expect to feel connected to families and to other staff or to other families and to staff. Then they can find meaningful ways to contribute as members of our PTSA, volunteers in the classroom and as partners in their children's education. In a partnership with families and the wider community, 
With the commitment of a caring staff, we nurture people who are well-rounded, compassionate, and globally aware. As part of our SIP monitoring process, we noticed that intermediate students were really struggling with basic math fact fluency. Ms. Matricano, one of our fifth grade teachers, initiated a weekly math clinic. It's completely voluntary, completely voluntary. All third, fourth, and fifth grade students are welcome to attend. And in addition to fact fluency, she decided to provide support that students identified as areas that they need themselves. So they, they, they identify a concept and they come to this group. Clinic is open to all students, and it's open to students as well who identify as strong math, math students. During clinic, students receive one-on-one -on -one support, not only from the teacher, but from those peers as tutors. Clinic runs through spring and is held one morning a week. At this point, the success of the initiative is measured mostly through student feedback. One student, student commented, math clinic helped me to learn my times tables, and that meant that I could do my fractions much easier. The comments in blue are from students who are there seeking support. The green are from students who are serving as tutors. A peer tutor commented, I came to help people, but it helped me too. When I was explaining how to do something, I had to think about the words that, that made sense and that was sometimes difficult. But when I got it and my classmate understood it, I felt great. So our students who are there as peers are actually learning as they, have to, as they help to teach their, their, their friends. Feedback from participants seems to indicate that students are feeling more confident with skills and concepts that they've self-identified as a result or as areas for improvement. And based upon the positive response, the sense of success and support students are feeling, we're exploring opportunities to continue math clinic throughout next year. Peter Kirk is a high achieving school. Our primary team works collaboratively to monitor student learning and to adjust learning needs, just like every other elementary school in our district. This year we noticed, well actually last year it began, we noticed that there were a handful of emerging readers who needed just a little bit more support, but they didn't need enough, their skills weren't lagging so much that they needed to be in an intervention program. So in partnership with our PTSA and the Lake Washington Schools Foundation, a pair of first grade teachers launched a reading club. This group meets twice a week for eight weeks and we hold two sessions throughout the school year. The goal is to promote academic success in fluency and accuracy through phonics, sight word recognition, and fluency practice. Reading Club provides parents and students with strategies to employ, employ at home five nights a week. Uh, and then that home practice builds, uh, it increases, we're seeing an increase in accuracy, fluency, and confidence. So our results. Uh, on the right, you'll see the results for this year. Research shows us that typically developing readers should increase fluency by two words per minute per year. Thanks to the commitment of the teachers, Mrs. Frost and Ms. Higgins, our current cohort has increased their re reading fluency an average of 30 minutes per week with the highest gain of 54 minutes per week, or per minute, sorry. 30 minutes per week is not very fast. Let's just acknowledge that. In eight weeks, students gained an average of 3.8 words per minute per week. It's almost double the growth we would see for a typically developing reader. And so we're starting our second round this week and look forward to ongoing success with that next group. As you're aware, when crafting goals for continuous improvement plans, we look, for, look to identify groups who demonstrate patterns of performance or behavior that are different from their peers. Last spring, uh, Mr. Maver and I noticed that male students were being sent to the office with what appeared to be a higher frequency than girls. We'll share those results in just a moment. We we're also concerned that male students of color were being disproportionately referred uh, to the office for unsafe recess behavior. So to better understand the situation, we instituted a system for tracking behavior. It's more a system for tracking behavior and it's not something that a student would receive like here's an incident slip for being bad. More, it was just really a tracking piece and Mr. Maver will share. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. Uh, so we instituted the tracking system, and again, this was based on the feedback and the conversations Monica and I were having, where we, we perceived that there was something that was happening. So we started tracking the data. During our first period of data collection, we started this one year ago. We collected data from April 2017 until June of 2017, and during that three-month period, we collected 474 total recess slips. By the way, we have a student population of about 560. That's a lot. That, that's more than we wanted. But the thing that really stuck out to us, of those 474, 412 of them came from male students. 
what we what this data showed to us was that there was a need for some systemic changes and some education for our recess staff that was a monitoring students. What we also noticed was that majority of the data came from students who collected three or more recess incident slips. For instance, if you observe in the kindergarten data, there were 31 students who got three or more in kindergarten. Whereas in first grade, you had about 16 students who collected three or more. The most common reason students were getting slips unsafe behavior or failure to follow the school rules. The largest group of students that had be tracked behavior were our kindergarten students with 192. So we noticed that the majority of the recess behavior slips came, were coming from repeat students. So we shared this data with our staff at the beginning of this school year. And from that, the term frequent flyer started to be used. And that's when we had a conversation as a staff. What, what are we saying when we say that? So we, tell, we decided to call frequent flyers any student who has three or more. And it was at that time we came to the conclusion, you're seven times more likely under this current system to get a recess slip than a, as a male than as a female. So because of that, based on this data, based on the discussion with recess staff, based on our feedback with each other, we decided that we were going to make some changes for this coming school year. Uh, and some of those goals we'll have Monica talk to you about. So we set the goal to reduce the number of recess slips incident er, in initiated for men, for male students as, by, let me start that one over. Uh, our goal was to reduce the percentage of male students generating recess slips by 35%. We put in place a system where there were classroom visits. We went to every classroom at the beginning of the year, talked about expectations. Uh, students were invited to the playground and received one, like on the spot training from the recess staff. Uh, we also had conversations among staff about what is appropriate play, what does it look like, sound like, feel like, feel like. And we had coaching conversations as well. Uh, in previous years, ch children who appeared to be fighting would be sent to the office for discipline. Uh, with a few follow-up questions, what looked like fighting was often, not always, but frequently a game of something called like ninja tag or Star Wars tag. While working with students who were more often than not male in kindergarten or first grade, it became evident that their behavior was not a function of disagreement, rather a commitment to their role in the world as a ninja. Another example can be found on the soccer field. We noticed that there were a couple of students being reported really regularly as being aggressive on the play field, on the soccer field. Specifically, we received reports that they were being kicked and some were stealing the soccer ball. With a bit of detective work, we figured out that what was really going on was soccer. And that by nature, you steal the ball in soccer and sometimes you get kicked. So there was a bit of an information conversation with not only staff, but with some students. In both example, understanding the context of behaviors helps provide a space for us to have instructional conversations with the students and with adults and to hold everyone accountable for respectful and appropriate play. Additionally, it helps to refine practice for, for the staff who supervise recess. And Mr. Maver is now going to share the outcomes. So the outcomes of this work and collecting of this data. Uh, in the blue, we have last year, April uh, to June of 2017, and then we have our last reporting period, January to the present. And uh, the total number of slips that were collected, 244. Um, 158 of them coming from male students, 86 of them coming from female students. This represents a 51% reduction in the total number of recess slips. This also, whereas 87% of the slips before were completed for male students, this time we're down to 65% being completed for male students. That represents a 22% reduction. That's a, a towards our goal of 35%. But of particular note, I want to pay attention to the frequent flyer information because as Monica was talking about with our goal, the systemic changes that we needed to make and the information about our expectations for students needed to improve. So in the previous year in kindergarten, we had 31 students who collected three or more recess slips, whereas this year's uh, current, current, current kindergartners collected, there were 14 students who collected three or more. Looking at cohort data, those same 14 students that are current first graders, five of them have collected three or more. The current second graders, uh, last year in first grade, there were 16 individual students who collected three or more. This year, 
one. Last year in uh, second grade, we had 11 individual students. This year in uh, third grade, we only have eight. So we're seeing a reduction almost at all levels uh, looking at our cohort data. And I think the best part for, for us, this gets be beyond the data and this gets down to the individual student level of how can we better support the, that individual student with what's happening not only out at recess but elsewhere in the building. So the next steps for this school year, we're gonna to continue to collect data with our refined approach. And part of that approach is to get the information back to the teachers as quick as possible. We found that for students second grade and younger, if you ask them what happened 20 minutes ago, sometimes you get an answer, sometimes you don't. And so being able to help them directly in the moment we found was the best way to help them learn. Um, an important note, we have started construction. What this means for Peter Kirk is that our playground area has become much smaller. So in anticipation of this, those systemic changes that Monica was talking about, we moved to a three lunch schedule and we never have any more than two grade levels out at recess at a time. We anticipate that there's gonna be, we anticipated that there would be a spike in our recess data simply due to lack of space for certain games. So in anticipation of this, we've been trying to provide clear expectations and guidelines for students in these playground areas. And we're very hopeful for our data collection from April through June. Let's skip ahead one more, and one more. So when trying to capture the heart of the school, uh, data is not the only tool for storytelling. Data helps us to monitor student learning, to set goals, to diagnose struggles, and to celebrate quantifiable successes for student learning and changes in student behavior. And getting to know a school, though, there's another piece, and that's what happens behind that data curtain. I want to make sure that you're aware of the generosity of spirit that binds our community together. Through partnership with our PTSA, the spirit of volunteerism is nourished by celebrating students who give time and commit and in the community and within the school. Our Eagles in Action program promotes and acknowledges students who devote their own time to helping others through community service. It's a highly popular activity. Uh, a few examples of the initiatives that students have initiated this year include Trash for Cash, a program that grew from fourth grade girls who just noticed garbage on the playground. Together, these four young ladies developed a plan that included what supplies do we need? Let's how do we promote it? How do we train peers? And they spend and they promote this program to pick up trash during, during recess. They also secured funding with matching grants to celebrate success. And the plan calls for students who earn money for Trash for Cash to donate it to a charity of their choice. So it's a double win. Another slice of Peter Kirk life that data doesn't always cover are, or capture are the actions and behaviors and attitudes that preserve that sense of community at Peter Kirk. This spring, a group of girls came to me and launched the Ladies and Lights Ladies and Lads Lunchtime Reading Club. Uh, all are welcome to join the group, and the student organizers identified books, created advertisements, met with the principal, and identified a spot to meet. This program, again, conceived and developed entirely by students, meets a need that some students have to, to find a quiet time to read and discuss books that they love, and so they have a little corner of the playground where they sit and chat. Finally, well, not finally, I've got one after this, but I would be remiss to, in failing to fully acknowledge the school family connection that makes Peter Kirk very special. The Peter Kirk community, inclusive of staff, parents, grandparents, volunteers, and local business people are in a well-bonded partnership. We have shared goals for assuring student well-being and safety. Collectively, we promote student social, emotional, and academic success, recognizing that our students are best served by a focus that includes the world beyond the school walls. My goal this evening has been twofold. First, to share with the board the values and work of Peter Kirk. Second, I hope that in some way you have a glimpse of what it's like to be a part of our community. At its heart, Peter Kirk are the people. We are committed, we are compassionate, and we are caring. We are people who persevere for student success and therefore we persevere for the common good. Prior to spring break, we broke ground on Peter Kirk 2.0 a new modern building that will be nestled in that same greenery in the heart of Kirkland. Once again, on behalf of our community, I'd like to thank our community for support with the bond. I look forward to opening a new building with increased capacity, and in the process, I'm committed to assuring that all that makes Peter Kirk an amazing place to learn, work, and play is carried into that new home. How wonderful it will be for the outside of our building to match the warmth, joy, success, and connection that characterizes the heart of who we are. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you for your attention and thank you for your support of our community. Thank you very much for that presentation. Um, I greatly appreciated the use of data and how you worked through that program. That was very fun to hear, so thank you and excellent work. Okay, so now we will be on to, we will be recognizing the Meritorious Budget Award. So Dr. Pierce. Great. Thank you, Siri. I'd like to invite Barbara Posthumous, Associate Superintendent, to come forward. And uh, we've got a brief presentation here to share with the community. And again, just want to apologize for our uh, technology this evening. The presentation that we're about to show is going to be a side screen. So I invite you once we get, uh, once we get the slides up to direct your attention to the side screen. And of course, we can see the presentation here in front of us. And our viewers on television will be able to see it as well. Presentation up. Do you have the board folder? Yeah. Sorry. There we go. Okay, so I invited uh, Barbara to step forward both to help me click <laughs> and uh, to uh, provide her um, as well as other members of the team some well earned recognition. So uh, Barbara's going to launch the slide here the, from the first part. Great, thank you. So uh, in my service as superintendent, uh, one of the things I am most proud of is our sound financial management and fiscal responsibilities as school district. For the past several years, we have been on a journey to earn the Meritorious Budget Award, and I'm pleased to share that we have earned the award for this year. So what is the Meritorious Budget Award, and how do you earn it? Well, physically, uh, Barbara's holding it up here. It's a, a very nice plaque uh, <laughs> that we received, and there's plenty of room on that plaque not only to have uh, earned the award for this year, but also for years in the future. So uh, if you want to click to the next mm -hmm. slide, Barbara, the Meritorious Budget Award, we did share this news in a press release on March 3rd. But this has been our first uh, board meeting opportunity to really share the news with the public. So the district earned the Meritorious Budget Award from the Association of School Business Officials International for our 2017-18 budget in recognition of our preparation of an accessible and accurate budget to build trust and clear communication with our stakeholders. Go ahead, Barbara. Uh, so I just wanted to spend a minute to highlight uh, how this award connects to our values and goals as a district. So you can see our uh, one of our values is being community connected. And on those out, outside rings, uh, it says parent engagement, public participation, and transparency and accountability. And we uh, believe strongly in uh, being as transparent as possible with our public and uh, being accountable, especially uh, for the dollars and how we use them. And so you can see one of our strategic goals is to use our resources effectively and be fiscally responsible, as well as to engage our communities. And so this award uh, really aligns uh, to that value and these goals. Go ahead, Barbara. <clears throat> so I just wanted to highlight a couple of things that we have shared in the past just globally around our fiscal responsibilities as a district and then highlight a couple aspects um, from the budget document itself as well as the annual strategic plan document that should be arriving in homes uh, shortly that highlights some of our results. So we are constantly looking for how we can save money and ensure that we're being as responsible as possible with the resources of our community. In 2014, uh, we did some bond refinancing, took advantage of our great credit rating, which I'll talk about in just a minute, to save our taxpayer $17.3 million. In 2015, uh, based on our sound financial practices, our credit rating was upgraded. S&P upgraded us to a rating of AA plus, and we continue to earn what's the elite Moody rating of AAA. Uh, this is the highest credit rating uh, sh of any school district in the state. It's only shared by two other school districts, Bellevue and Issaquah. In 2016, we then did an additional uh, refinancing, again, taking advantage of our great credit rating to save our taxpayers an additional $6.9 million. These are just a couple of examples of what we do. Now, the award that I'm uh, talking about tonight is really for 
for how we're presenting information to our public in a usable and readable form and being very clear about where our resources come from and where are they going. So if you go to uh, the next slide, just another step on our journey, this is something that we've been working on for a number of years. And when I say we, uh, it's been our business office, mm -hmm. it's been our communications department, mm -hmm. it's been uh, me, yep. <laughs> it's been uh, many of us working toward earning this recognition for the district. Uh, we did earn the pathway to the Meritorious Budget Award for our 16-17 budget. And again, this is uh, the first year we've earned the actual award. So uh, I mentioned a couple of documents. Uh, the document on the right that, that says the 17-18 budget, this is actually the document that we submit to uh, the uh, reviewers, the review, yep. uh, the review team uh, to earn the award. So that's our budget document. And uh, typically a school district budget can look like a it's called an F-195, and it's not a very user-friendly, uh, community-friendly document. Uh, it's not that easy to understand. Uh, that's our requirement to have mm -hmm. that document, but we believe in going above and beyond that baseline requirement and presenting information to our public in a manner in which they can actually understand it. And that's why we are earning the award. And it's not only that uh, we're presenting the information, but we're, we're making the, uh, the argument and presenting evidence that we are using resources effectively to accomplish our goals. We publish another document every year called uh, Strategic Plan Update and Annual Report. Uh, that's the document that you see, it's just the first page of it that you see on the uh, left side of the screen. Uh, that will be arriving in uh, home shortly. And so a couple slides I just wanna highlight tonight are from both of these documents. So if you go to the next slide, this is actually an infographic that we include on the uh, Strategic Plan Annual Report. And what this shows on the left side, it shows that as a district we receive lower funding than the average large school district in the Puget Sound area. And we, on the right, it shows we spend a higher percentage of our funds on teaching than average. So you can see uh, on the chart, there we are, lowest Lake Washington School District in terms of our uh, funding per pupil, revenue per student. And then on the right side, we spend the highest percent of general fund on to total teaching. So we believe strongly in channeling the resources to where they're gonna make the most difference for our students, and we know that is in our classrooms. The next slide you'll see is one from our budget document, and what this shows is uh, where our money goes in terms of expenditures. So uh, just one thing to highlight here, this shows you again total teaching 74.9%. Uh, it shows uh, the percent of building administration 6.9, maintenance and operations, central administration 4.9. That's the lowest percent of spending on central administration than all districts in Washington State over 20,000. So uh, that's a, a low number, and when you think about a district our size with nearly 30,000 students, we have 16 directors and nine associate directors supporting all of the work in the district at the lowest percent spending amongst large districts over 20,000 in the state. So another accomplishment to highlight there. If you go to the next slide, uh, this is a, a page out of the budget document, and what this shows is not only our five strategic goals, but the objectives associated with each goal. And so the budget document is organized around how we're making strategic investments aligned to our objectives to accomplish our goals. So uh, every year we do a public presentation as uh, part of our uh, presenting the budget to the board and to the community. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of slides. You'll see them again this year when we present the budget. But uh, what we do every year is we take each strategic goal and objective and we specify what resource, if there's additional resource that we're investing to accomplish that goal, uh, that gets highlighted here. And we have a running record of those strategic investments from the previous year as well. So what this slide shows you, this is again from last year, you'll see an updated slide when we bring you the budget this spring. But for our goal to ensure academic success for every student, and our objective to provide rigorous, relevant, and effective curriculum and assessments. Uh, the top part of the slide shows you the work that we've been doing over the past several years, and then the bottom of the slide shows if we're uh, 
building in additional investment of resource to accomplish that goal in that year's budget. So for example, last year we invested an additional 205,000 uh, for musical instrument repair, for training for our K-5 writing curriculum, and for training for our K-12 science curriculum. Then if you go to the next slide, we also remind the community here in this presentation of resources that we invested in the in the previous years. So you can see on this slide again what we invested in 14, 15, 15, 16, and 16, 17. So each year we add to that. Uh, again, the goal here is accountability and transparency so people know where the money is going and that it's being well spent and targeted toward the benefit of students to overall accomplish our mission and vision. So uh, we just wanted to spend a couple of minutes tonight <laughs> celebrating uh, the accomplishment of earning the Meritorious Budget Award. And again, I want to thank Barbara and uh, give Barbara yeah. an opportunity to thank members of her team and also thank Shannon and mm -hmm. the Communications Department for their work in this as well. Yeah. Great. As, as Dr. Pierce mentioned, we've spent uh, many years, or you know, more than a few years uh, working, and I appreciate uh, your support as we've changed the budget document over these years. And uh, but uh, the Association of School Business Officials that gives out this award and national, um, there are districts all across the country that that um, apply and receive this award. So we're very pleased to be part of that um, exclusive group. So, and I do want to thank uh, my budget manager Lynn Pike and her team for all the work that they put into this and again Shannon in the communications department um, it's not a one-person effort it takes many many people to do this so we're very pleased of the work that we have done so thank you thank you very much it was a, a great accomplishment over the course of this year remember it was first discussed actually about three to four years ago um, so it's exciting to finally be there. And if you haven't had the chance to look at the budget, it actually is an interesting read, um, and it aligns well with our strategic goals and helps to really sort of outline what the, that process is. So excellent job by staff. Thank you very much. Okay, so now our next step is that the board is in receipt of a board appeal of a student disciplinary action. Um, I would like to ask if Mr. and Mrs. Abram Profeta to step forward, please. So WAC 392, hold on to, yeah, that's fine. WAC 392 400 255 provides that if the grievance is not resolved at the building level grievance meeting or the grievance to the superintendent of the district, the student, parent, or guardian shall have the right to present a written and or oral grievance to the board of directors during the board's next regular meeting. So following your 15 minute presentation to the board, the board shall notify the student, parent, or guardian of its response to the grievance within 10 school business days after the date of the board meeting. At this time, if you could please introduce yourself and present the information you would like for the board to consider, and we will set aside those 15 minutes for your presentation. Thank you. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. Pierce. My name is Lisa Abram Profeta. I'm a parent in um, the, I believe we're in the Juanita community. Um, I have three students at Sandberg Elementary, and tonight I'm speaking to you about our, our third grader. He's our middle son. And I, I won't take up the 15 minutes entirely. I just wanted to give you a couple of the highlights. I do have a letter that I can leave with you. Not sure where to leave it, but I can do that after I'm finished. Um, the reason I'm bringing it this far, I guess, is because rules are such a serious um, part of the life of our son, given where he's coming from with his particular set of disabilities. It gives him the consistency. It allows him to grow and sort of work to towards those goals in the IEP that he has. And if we can't assure him that rules were followed in implementing the, the suspension, we have a harder time really keeping this as a really valid, valid lesson for him and really growing with it. Um, essentially what happened, there was a disturbance in class. He was brought down to the principal's office, um, got calm enough, returned to class. There was an interaction with another student who ended up hurting him and in response, there was another disruption. And the principal has stated she wasn't going to 
implement a suspension for the first disruption, but it was the second one that, that sort of tipped it over the edge. So there's a few different ways we can look at it, right? Was everything handled appropriately up to the point of returning to, cl to class? Not exactly. Uh, was everything handled appropriately thereafter? I would say very likely not, It would, is what I would argue. Um, a few of the rules that I've found that do apply, um, of course, since he's a student with an IEP with special education services, he's protected under the IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act of 2004. Uh, principal has been aware of that. She's been at his IEP meetings. Um, a couple of the district policies, um, I will refer to them as the different file numbers that they're listed on. File JG, um, prior to imposing the suspension or other corrective action, they're required to consult with whoever manages the IEP or maintains the 504 plan. He has an IEP, special education resources, and the teacher were not consulted. The special ed teacher was present for part of what happened, but he was not consulted as to whether these actions arise out of his disability. And it's very arguable that yes, they do, given what's in the letter, and you'll read about his background and, and what that involves. Um, further, file JG-R, section C2. I am that annoying, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Prior to short-term suspension of any student, you have to have a conference with the student. Now, again, given his set of disabilities, how he understands verbally multi-step directions and self-regulation impulsivity, he was already in a heightened state with a very stressful incident with an adult that he wasn't comfortable with because of previous interactions. There wasn't really gonna be a way to get information through to him at that moment or to get information out of him at that moment. And I don't feel like that there was a really fair chance for that to happen. So that was another one. Um, and again, back to file JG, suspensions or expulsions shall be used only for serious instances of student misconduct. And I'd like to highlight this particularly for the board, if I may. Um, at no point did the principal, the teacher, or in subsequent interactions with the compliance officer for the district, was this ever characterized as a serious instant of conduct, misconduct. <clears throat> I have been uh, witness to and heard about multiple instances from all three of my kids, friends, and things like that on the playground, in the classroom, on school grounds that are far worse than this. In fact, my son has been injured on the playground subsequent to this incident. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and effectively nothing was done. Nothing was imposed on the students who were ramming, kicking, punching, and shoving him. Um, I was told that it was a game where everybody misunderstood the rules. But my son understood enough to say, please stop, I don't want to play. Still happened. And it's inconsistently applied. So there were just a lot of opportunities along the way in the whole process for the rules to be followed or things to get set back on the right course. They didn't. Um, I just think given that he needs to have that extra information and that time to process, she's aware of it, it should have been done. And another piece that was also not done is how we were notified. She contacted a phone number that we've had deleted with the school and the district for a long time. I'm not sure where it came from, especially since she and I have spoken by phone several times on my cell phone, the correct number. Um, if this was indeed a quote unquote serious instance of misconduct, why would there only be one phone call? I, I, I don't have an answer, but if it was serious, I would think you would contact other emergency numbers and follow that kind of protocol. So another missed opportunity for your following the rules. Um, let's see, notice must be given no later than the date the decision to remove is made. The decision was made on the 6th to impose the suspension for the 7th. Obviously I never received the notice of that until after school hours, which is effectively past the date that it was supposed to be because school hours end at 3.30. I didn't find out until almost 4.00 you know, in the pickup line and stopping traffic and all of this. Uh, there was no 
opportunity to follow process for us to even find out what processes were available to to have a conversation or a discussion with uh, with the school. Sorry, I'm just referring to the rest of this. Uh, there was a very brief last minute meeting the morning of the suspension, uh, during which we found out more about what the suspension would entail. It also, again, went against everything that we know about and, and need to require for the IEP. He was gonna be placed in a public area, sitting by himself with a packet of work. And if you are familiar enough with the IEP, he absolutely cannot do that and shouldn't do that. It's, it's a recipe for failure for this particular child. Um, and when I asked, if, could he have more supervision, I was told that basically no, because I need to be able to do my job. And I was a little confused because I thought that was part of what was supposed to happen, that if she implements it, she supervises it. I'm not, I'm not clear on the rules on that particular piece. Um, so. Overall, like I said, the rules are very important. We need to follow them for him and for all the kids. The protections are in place, particularly for somebody protected under the IDEA Act. And um, in the alternative, if the board cannot see its way to reverse the suspension, uh, we would just ask that the board maybe reprioritize extra resources and training, perhaps highlighting some additional resources for teachers, administrators, district-wide in supporting these kids. There's rules in place, it's there for their protection, but it's not being done. And I would just like to highlight that for the board and uh, for your consideration. Thank you so much. Where could I put this? If you could hand it to Diane Jenkins over Thank there. Thank you. She will make sure we can get a copy of that. Oops, that does not belong to me. So thank you very much for taking the time. So now we will move to public comment. On a monthly basis, the Board of Director provides an opportunity for public comment during board meetings. The public comment period is a time reserved during our working meeting for the board to hear from the public. There are multiple avenues in addition to public comment for community members to share their comments, opinions, and or concerns with the board, including by email, phone calls, or letters. Please note that public comment is not a question and answer session with the board. The board and superintendent will not respond to community members during public comment as our goal is to listen and to learn from you. Typically, the board will allow up to 30 minutes on the agenda for public comment, and if the number of people are signed up to speak on the same topic, the board limits the time devoted to a single topic to 30 minutes. If you are speaking to a subject that has already been raised by previous speakers, please focus on aspects of the topic that have not yet been addressed. That will help us to get a more complete picture of the situation. Each individual is provided up to three minutes to speak in order to ensure that we hear from a variety of people, individuals cannot share or donate their time to others. When your name is called, please approach the podium, speak into the microphone, giving your full name and school attendance area for the record. We do have a stoplight system that will show a yellow light when you have one minute left, and red signifies that your three minutes are up. Please wrap up at that point. It is important for all community members to feel welcome and safe during the board's business meeting. The board does not take public comments on issues related to personnel or individually named staff at board meetings. Audience members are expected to treat all attendees with respect and civility. So our first person signed up to address the board this evening is Linda Gorett. I have something that, yep. Yeah. You can go ahead. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. Pierce. Um, I've actually not been in contact with you. I was under the impression that uh, John Holman was the superintendent, so I <laughs> apologize. All of my communications have been with him um, and, and the board, so nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Linda Jarrett. I am the uh, homeowners uh, president of uh, a Devereux Homeowners Association. Um, our children um, go to the Snoqualmie Valley School District. 
Um, I am here representing um, a few communities, uh, Devereaux, Camden um, Trails, and there are a few homes uh, north of Northeast 24th. In total, there's about 73 homes. Um, we live in an area that's kind of this forgotten uh, territory, and if you look on your maps, you'll, you'll, you'll see that. Um, our communities have petitioned several times over the last uh, 15 years uh, to become part of the Lake Washington School District. Um, back in 2007, we were annexed into the city of Sammamish, and we embraced that and were excited by that because we thought that automatically that meant that we were going to then become part of the Lake Washington School District. Um, and even though the city of Sammamish supported that, um, it, it, it did not happen. So um, we currently belong to Snoqualmie Valley School District. I do want to say that they are um, a very, um, an excellent district. Um, uh, with excellent teachers, excellent, excellent quality uh, education, but North Bend and Fall City and Snoqualmie are not our communities. So our kids currently, um, if you look on the second sheet, I'm kind of an old school girl, so I don't have <laughs> cut some paper, and I did email these things to you in the afternoon, but um, we currently, for the Lake Washington, we're walking distance to Lake Washington schools, um, where our children have to travel 15 miles to get to uh, North Bend to go to school. Um, and it just doesn't make, uh, just doesn't make sense to us. So, and, and having to travel that distance, our children are not uh, participating uh, socially or social networking with their, with the kids um, that live in their community. We're just, we're just not part of the, the Snoqualmie Valley School District. Um, and in fact, last year, the kids were, our children were allowed to um, attend Lake Washington through variances, and then that stopped this year. And so then they were suddenly placed with, uh, in a school district where they would otherwise have no sort of um, interaction with. So um, recently, I know that there has been uh, an approval of many bonds and levies um, that would assist this district uh, to incorporate our community into your district. Um, that's what we believe. Um, and. I guess um, I'm trying to think over when I went to the, oh, I'm on red, okay. <laughs> I didn't see the yellow come up. So anyway, um, I did send this to you before. So hopefully you can, again, just kind of read through those notes and look at this with a fresh eye. I know some of you have probably seen our petition in the past if you've been on the board for more than five years. Um, but to look at it with an open mind uh, and, and hopefully uh, and revisit the situation and make a decision in the best interest of our children because our, that's who we are here. Uh, there's several people from the community that are here supporting um, this and we've all come together because in the best interest of our, of our children. So thank you for your time. Thank you. And so the next person I have listed is Louis Garrett. It was a combined one? It was okay. a joint effort, but then when you said that I couldn't borrow his time, I just <laughs> 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 right. Thank you. And so the next person I have is B. Dinesh. So if you could please say your name and your school area would be great. Yeah, my Thank name you. is Bagya. Um, my last name is Dinesh. And I live in Sammamish, and uh, my kids go to Blackwell Elementary, and my older one go to Inglewood, so it's East Lake community. So the reason here, I'm here, I'm with my husband here, just to advocate for my little youngest son. His date of birth is December 6, 2011. And uh, you know he started going to a school called Synergy Learning Academy in Issaquah. Uh, so before I start the conversation, I have been in contact with the school, the principal, and then the principal directed me to uh, the director of placement services and then uh, Dr. Livingston, and then that has gone to Dr. Holman, and then to you, and then I have, I have a reply, which is kind of in moderation by Dr. Matt Livingston on Friday evening but I still want the board to hear and kind of reconsider and make an exception. If things can be worked out, I would be really happy, but I'm not saying 
you directing you to do yes or no at this moment, but I will wait and you know be patient for my son. So uh, <laughs> this is my first time to kind of come and talk to the public and you know ask for justice. So I don't know how this is going to work. So he is underage by three months for kindergarten, but still when he when we uh, put him in a private school, so he was kind of performing you know, way above his level. So they kind of uh, um, transitioned him to first grade. So they gave him a placement test and he cleared for that and then he got started on his first grade. So technically I did contact the school and also the Lake Washington School District, um, you know, a couple of schools around asking, um, you know, if he will get a similar grade placement. I was told yes. And I do have three or four parents of my own nationality who went to that school, and they are awarded the similar grade placement. But now, you know, the officials are kind of denying, you know, it was a mistake or it's against the school policies. I do not know how was that variance or exception made. So I, I'm not here to take out names or anything to the public, but I'm asking if things can be, you know, read or listened through again. So when he appeared for the COGAT testing and the Quest placement testing, they did not consider the accreditation of the school. They just said that you have to live in the Lake Washington School District and by grade he has to be grade one to get into the second grade placement test. And he cleared the first level COGAT with 99 percentile and the second level again 99 and then he just lost by one percentile of, can I, can I finish? You Little can bit? wrap up really okay. quickly, thank so, you. So yeah, my question is by grade, you know, which is kind of, they are testing on the second, end of second grade level for the COGAT, like the Quest placement test, my son cleared. So by skills, he definitely possessed that. But when I go into the school, they are not considering that he is, he can be transitioned to similar grade. So when they kind of got him into the testing mode, they considered the school as an, school, but when they are kind of doing like a transitioning to the placement, they do not consider. And I did contact OSPI and a private, you know, the consultant at OSPI, and they really appreciated that I am in the Lake Washington school area, which is one of the most competitive district, and I've been here for 13 years, and I do not want to sell my house and move out of this area. I'm going to fight for him, but I want the school to make an exception or the board to waive the policy and kind of reconsider the placement decision. So I will wait for the board to let me know. And I did appeal to the accelerated program, but they denied because, you know, it's like a little complex situation. It needs a little bit more one-on-one -on -one meeting, in-depth discussion for this. So I can kind of give this. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the next person I have listed is Ryan Christian. Uh, hello, members of the school board. My name is Ryan Krishnan, and I'm a junior at Tesla STEM High School. Uh, in my time through elementary school at Samantha Smith to Redmond School, uh, to Redmond Middle School, and then finally at Tesla, I've only been exposed to environmental science in my sophomore year with the AP Environmental Science class. Um, and I, I think that in order to keep students informed about these pressing issues that will be relevant throughout their lives, we need to educate them starting in elementary school. So starting last summer, I developed Operation Sustain, an educational simulation game that teaches students about the basics of environmental science and climate change. I found that these digital natives would prefer learning in these interactive computer-based simulations. And uh, in creating this game, students are tasked with creating a successful city by placing houses, farms, and energy sources, and making decisions for their citizens like their transportation choices and their taxes. And over the course of the game, they learn about renewable energy and pollution. Uh, so I decided to try and write curriculum based on it to educate them based on the next generation science standards. Uh, and then I applied for uh, 30 old laptops from the LWC tech, de uh, tech department to be donated. Uh, and then I piloted the curriculum with 
two fifth grade classes from McAuliffe and then one second and third grade class at Rosa Parks and found some really successful results. They were, I quizzed them before and after and found that they more than doubled their initial scores. So um, they were actually improving and showing that they understood the science standards. But then I also talked to the teachers afterward who said that this was the most engaged they'd ever seen their students. And one teacher in particular said that they thought that their students were um, so getting caught up so much in having fun that they didn't even know that they were learning. Um, so when I leave next year, I want to make sure that this initiative doesn't leave with me. Uh, and I would like to work with you to integrate environmental science education to elementary school curriculum so teachers can address this is these issues every year. LWC owes it to its students to prioritize sustainability in the classroom, as other districts are doing. And I invite you to go to osustain.org and connect with me to ensure that every student is future ready. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Our next step is we will actually be taking a 50. Oh, I'm sorry. We have one more person who would like to speak. Bob Yor. I apologize. Hello, uh, board and, and superintendent. Um, first, congratulations on all the wonderful things you've done. Uh, I, I think it was a great recap, and especially the award you got for the budget is, is awesome. Um, I went to the budget meeting, and um, I, it's important that it is readable. And apparently, you won the award because it's more readable. So I think that that's a, a real accomplishment. I looked for that award in the, re, in the Revenue Reporter, and I couldn't find it. Um, I did find it on the news in your website. So um, it's nice to get the word out. Um, I really want to bring the most important thing I want to say today is that the new superintendent that you're going to be hiring, our CEO, that I think it's really important that you um, involve the, the public in your decision making process. I don't think we had that six years ago. Um, we need to engage the public, especially the parents. So that's my number one ask that you do that. <laughs> and I think that we'll all be a lot happier from that. Um, I did send you in writing what I thought about the high salaries that the administration has, the central administration. Uh, Mr. Stewart brought up a couple meetings ago that he thought maybe some of the money should be pushed down to the janitors, the teachers. Um, I think the um, some of the directors that interface with the schools. And, um, you know, even shaving off 1% from the central administration would, would help. Um, it's my understanding the directors make 160, $169,285 per year. I think they could certainly afford to shave off 15 or 20 percent of their funds of their salary. Um, they also get a $2,000 telephone allowance. Um, the, the 14, the associate directors get paid $153,300. You think they could shave off a few thousands, ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars? So please keep in mind that teachers, the janitors, um, the cafeteria folks, when you look at the budget, and uh, keep them in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak for public comment who didn't have a chance to sign up? OK. So we will now take a 15-minute break, and the meeting will reconvene at 8.16. Thank you. Do I gavel the little thing to you? All right. Okay.
All right, well, welcome back. And so we will now continue with our meeting. The next item on our agenda is the consent agenda. And I will now entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Move approval. Uh, I'll second that. It has been moved by Director Carlson and seconded by Director La Liberty. And Dr. Pierce, will you now pour the, poll the board? Cassandra? Yes. Eric? Uh, yes. Siri? Yes. Mark? Yes. Chris? Yes. The donations. Okay, tab seven has all of our donations tonight totaling $131,120 rounding to the nearest dollar. So we have a big long list. Lake Washington High School, excuse me, Lake Washington Schools Foundation to Lake Washington High School, $1,286 to support robotics. $5,688 from Alexander Graham Bell PTSA to Bell Elementary to support classroom enrichment. $5,083 from Blackwell PTSA to Blackwell Elementary to purchase a kiln. $4,664 from Rachel Carson PTSA to Carson Elementary to purchase star reading and accelerated reader subscriptions and to support extracurricular activities. $5,487 from Albert Einstein PTSA to Einstein Elementary to provide stipends for outdoor education, music, and lunch buddies. $1,400 from Robert Frost PTSA to Frost Elementary for a stipend for student council. $2,959 from Juanita Schools Foundation to Juanita Elementary for a stipend for computer support and to support staff development. $4,525 from Lakeview Elementary PTSA to Lakeview Elementary to support classroom enrichment. $1,540 from Redmond Elementary PTSA to Redmond L to purchase electronic language translator devices. $16,002 from Rosa Parks PTSA to Rosa Parks Elementary for stipends for drama, choir, and extracurricular activities. $1,050 from Emily Hagen to Rosa Parks Elementary to purchase a buddy bench. $2,500 from Rose Hill Elementary PTSA to Rose Hill Elementary to purchase a bike rack and a memorial rock. $1,839 from Samantha Smith PTSA to Smith Elementary to support assemblies. $2,117 from Thoreau Elementary PTSA to Thoreau Elementary for outdoor education scholarships. $16,000 and $2 from Wilder Elementary PTSA to Wilder to provide stipends for math and science clubs, game club and motor skills and enrichment club. $16,850 from Environmental and Adventure School PTO to EAS to support community stewardship projects, outdoor ed and Wednesday electives. $4,500 from Evergreen Middle School PTSA to Evergreen Middle to purchase school agendas, $3,575 from Inglewood Middle School PTSA to Inglewood Middle to purchase novels and PE training equipment, $2,419 from North Star Parent Fund to North Star to purchase classroom supplies, site li license for IXL math and to support the music program, $4,648 from Rose Hill Middle School PTSA to Rose Hill Middle to provide stipends for extracurricular activities, $1,516 from Stella Scola PTO to Stella Scola to provide classroom enrichment. $11,018 from International Community School PTSA to ICS for scholarships and criminal justice textbooks. $3,626 from the Juanita Rebels Booster Club to Juanita High School to provide music concert transportation and football training video. $7,768 from the Lake Washington High School Baseball Booster Club to Lake Washington High School to purchase batting cages. And finally, $2,000 from Lexus Echo Challenge to Tesla STEM High School to provide classroom enrichment. So a big long list tonight. Very generous donations totaling $131,120. <laughs> well, thank you. And we'd like to personally thank everyone who has chosen to support our students in schools. And we greatly appreciate your generosity. It helps to have our students be future ready. So we are now moving on to our non-consent agenda. And our first item is the naming of the new school mascot for Clara Barton Elementary School. Dr. Pierce. Great. So we have two similar situation recommendations because we have uh, mascot names to bring before the board for both Clara Barton Elementary School and Ella Baker Elementary School. And you'll remember that just recently the names of those schools came before the board for approval and part of our policy also speaks to mascots. So if you turn to tab eight, 
the situation for uh, both, and we'll do each one separately, is that um, Again, the names get submitted to the Board of Directors for approval. Uh, the Board shall name the mascot based on uh, the recommendation that comes forward, and our policy specifies that mascots shall be culturally sensitive and appropriate. So in terms of process, it follows the very similar process to naming the actual facility where um, students uh, are met with by the principal, uh, students nominate mascots uh, that meet our guidelines, uh, committee of parents, students, and staff, uh, well, it's students on the secondary pair down the list. Um, that list is then shared with the board for review. And uh, once those names are reviewed and approved at that level, they uh, go on a ballot and students get to vote. And the final names we have to uh, present for your approval this evening. So we will start with uh, Clara Barton, elementary school. Sure, John can come forward here uh, and I will do the drum roll, please. But the final names uh, for Clara Barton that were on the ballot for students in terms of their mascots. So students voted between Bulldogs, Cardinals, Wildcats, and Bobcats. And the winning name, drum roll please, was <laughs> the Clara Barton Bobcats. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, the, the recommendation is for the board to approve the nominated mascot, Bobcats, um, as presented as the mascot for Clara Barton Elementary School. Move approval. Second. All right. It has been moved by <laughs> Director Carlson and seconded by Director La Liberty that we approve the nominated mascot, Bobcat, as presented for, as the mascot for Clara Barton Elementary School. All those in favor, please signify by voting aye. 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 All those opposed? <laughs> Hearing none, motion carries. Excellent. The Bobcats. Okay. The Bobcats, thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, similarly, Ella Baker, elementary school put their uh, names through the same process and so the final names that were submitted for students to vote uh, were the Ella Baker Badgers, Bears, Bumblebees, Elephants, and Elk. Those were the choices and drum roll please, the mascot, the winning mascot was? The Ella Baker Bears. <laughs> the Bears. All right. I would now entertain a motion to approve the nominated bear so as moved. presented. A uh, second. It has been moved by Director Sage and seconded by Director La Liberty that we approve the nominated mascot as presented as the mascot for Ella Baker Elementary School. All those in favor, please signify by voting aye. 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 All those opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. We have mascots. All Sweet. right, we now have mascots for our two new schools. So the next item on the non-consent agenda is EL3, Communication and Counsel to the Board. So Dr. Pierce. So if you turn to tab 10, uh, we have uh, for your review and approval, EL3, Communication and Counsel to the Board. Uh, all of the areas are uh, in compliance in terms of the evidence presented in alignment with the current policy and uh, the, the full document is found in your board folder and so the recommendation this evening is for the board of directors to approve the monitoring report for EL3 communication and counsel to the board. We will put forward a motion, then discussion will happen. So I would now entertain a motion to approve the report. So moved. It has been moved by Director Carlson and seconded by Director La Liberty. <laughs> okay. To approve the monitoring report for EL3. At this point, I'd like to open it for discussion. Is this the point you want to discuss uh, the amendments or is that the later point? This would all be around approving the monitoring report currently as is and how it was presented in regards to the compliance and if there's any questions around that. Any concerns? Okay, so. All those in favor, please signify by voting aye. 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 And no one opposed, excellent. 
Now it appears you had some questions that you wanted to say. Or I think now would be a good time to. Well, I have uh, what I'd like to propose is some amendments uh, to the EL3 that I'd like everyone to take a look at. I think uh, here are some hard copies, those of you that didn't memorize them when I sent them out electronically. If I, I could ask a question, what, what I would like is to be able to, the ELs, in order to, to put this, possibly consider that this be on a future agenda item to be able to go forward, and we've talked about needing to revise our ELs and look through them and dealing with reasonable interpretation. Does Chris have one? Yep. Okay. Yep. Well, and you have one? Yeah. Are we talking about this or are we just moving on? Go ahead. Oh, I just want to thank Mark. I think these are some good ideas, and I, 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 uh, I echo Mark's sentiment that we look at amendments to EL3 as part of the work plan of the board, and I hope that we add that to the work plan. Any other discussion on that? I would only ask that I realize we, pro we will need a uh, work session probably on this. Uh, I would appreciate it if we would hasten that schedule. Excellent. The, the goal will be we'll sit down and come up with that plan. Um, our goal we had spoken about briefly with all our executive limitations from our extended board retreat is to consider looking at that reasonable interpretation and that component. And ideally by the end of June 30th was going to be our goal to have worked through most of these. EL4 we've had some questions and EL3. So those will be the first ones that we start to work through. Uh, I'd only uh, hasten the I suggest that we make sure that these are uh, considered and decided upon by the end of the school year because I don't want to see this lapse over into next year because next year I want to have a clean slate of making sure we have this information. Okay, agreement. So our goal would be by June 30th. So we'll go working through the work plan and we can have that put together to looking how that's in through. Okay. For our next, uh, sorry about that. All right, the next item on our agenda is ends result one on mission and vision. So in this case, we do have a presentation. We have all received a written report as well. Um, so I will ask John Holman to please step Send it to me. And I'm gonna hand it over to Tracy. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> great. So uh, I, I need someone to help me click. <laughs> and John and I are gonna co-present co this. Uh, so uh, as uh, the board knows, there was some extensive conversation at the extended study session in March about uh, our uh, end results uh, presentations and we learned a new framework uh, to apply. And so uh, we've already done the other ERs this year following the old format in the old framework, but we had the opportunity, even though it was a quick turnaround, to apply the new framework to ER1. So uh, as Siri mentioned, I took the framework, uh, did the written document in alignment with the framework, and then we put the uh, presentation in the same framework. So it looks a little different from the previous ERs. And uh, as, you know, as we worked through this, the team thinks it's a very effective way uh, to, to present the, the information. So uh, you do have the full written report under uh, tab 11 to refer to as we go. Uh, and I'll take us through some of this and then uh, John's gonna take us through some of it. So we'll go ahead and get started. <laughs> and you need to click a little more, <laughs> thank you. Okay, so um, end result one is our biggest end, it's our mission and vision. It's why we exist as an organization and what we're trying to accomplish for students. So our mission is for each student to graduate, prepared to lead a rewarding, responsible life as a contributing member of our community and greater society. And our vision is every student future ready, prepared for college, prepared for the global workplace, prepared for personal success. It's just a, important to um, acknowledge and remind ourselves that all of the other ERs are really leading indicators toward this big accomplishment of this end, which is our, you know, our biggest end. So 
as we thought about and worked through putting this big end into the new framework, uh, in March uh, there was discussion around sub-ends, that when you are looking at a big end, whether it's a big end around literacy or a big end around math, or in this case a big end around graduating future ready, um, there are sub-ends. And so we identified the three sub-ends for ER1 as as really defining what we mean by graduates and graduation rates, and then enrollment in college level coursework in high school and enrollment in post-secondary, uh, in a post-secondary institution within two years of graduation. So you'll see when we get to the policy interpretation part of the report why um, these sub-ends are so critical to meeting the big end of graduating future ready. So for each, uh, we've organized the, both the written report and the presentation to uh, go through each, sub, each of those three sub-ends and to speak to the policy criteria, the observable conditions, alignment to ends, the targets and rationale for those targets, and then present uh, what we believe is sufficient evidence or potentially partial evidence toward achievement of the end and the rationale for uh, why we believe it's either in you know full achievement or partial achievement. So uh, that's the, the structure that we're going to use. And if you want to also follow along with the full presentation, uh, we will now be on page six, graduation, graduates and graduation rates. So uh, some of this is included in the, um, all of this is included in the written report, and then the written report also includes some additional context information. But just to call out, we've never really, as part of ER1, defined what we mean by graduate or how does graduation year get established and some of those things. So as part of the policy interpretation, we're now including that, that graduates are interpreted as students who have met graduation requirements for their assigned year. And in order to graduate, students must earn credit in all required areas, and those areas are specified and mandated by the State Board of Education. Those state graduation requirements are aligned to college entrance requirements. So uh, the new 24 credit requirement, uh, students earning those credits in those areas have the eligibility to enter a four-year college or university immediately following high school. It's also important to note that demonstrating proficiency for learning the state standards in English language arts and mathematics in terms of uh, taking and passing the state assessment uh, is uh, interpreted as if you can do that, you're also, that's part of graduating future ready because those standards based on Common Core uh, provide clear and consistent learning goals that are designed by design, they're meant to prepare students for college career and life. So the standards that students are required to show proficiency on in those assessments are research and evidence-based. Uh, they are clear, understandable, and consistent. They're aligned with college and career expectations. They're based on rigorous content and the application of knowledge through higher order thinking skills. And they are informed by other top performing countries to prepare all students for success in our global economy and society. So. Uh, I want to call out, and it's here on page six in the written report, that then the interpretation is, you know, the superintendent CEO is interpreting that students who graduate having earned all the required graduation credits and having met the state graduation requirements, that they are prepared to lead a rewarding, responsible life as a contributing member of our community and greater society, and they are graduating future ready. Again, this is one sub-end. There's two other sub-ends that complete the full picture. So then we get to... A the observable conditions and targets for ER1, again, just, just now focusing on the graduates and graduation rates sub-end. Uh, our target is 100% on-time graduation rate, um, and that is uh, the number of, uh, included in that is what we present is the number of non-graduates, and this actually happens prior to ER1, with reasons and dropout rate is measured by district data. And we also have the same target for extended graduation rate. So we haven't, when we set these targets, we said we want 100% graduation rate and we're also looking for 100% extended graduation rate. That's our aspirational goal. So our commitment and aspirational goal is to 100% on time and extended graduation rate. However, since that is an aspirational goal, uh, and it's a multi-year effort to reach that high aspirational goal. 
uh, we interpret sufficient evidence as specified um, as follows. So if you go to the next slide, that uh, sufficient evidence exists and that we're uh, making achievement toward that end if 85% or more students in a particular student group are graduating, if that student percentage shows, uh, it, that should say, sorry, an improving three-year trend, and there's no more than a two percentage point decline <laughs> in the three-year trend, and if the district is ranked, if our ranking is in the 80th percentile of the 49 school districts that are over 6,500, or that the percentage of students graduating is between 71 and 84 percent if the district rank is in the 94th percentile. Now, where did that come from? I just want to call that out. Those business rules are the same business rules that inform the color coding data overview sheet. So to get a quick glance at where we're uh, making progress toward achieving that and or we're making maybe partial achievement, you can see just at a glance on the color-coded sheet that is um, page three of the written report. Okay, all right, we'll keep going. So um, again, I sort of spoke to this already of why is that it being interpreted as uh, reasonable um, and sufficient evidence toward accomplishment given the high aspirational goal of 100%. Uh, we also are not just looking at the all-student group. So uh, since that criteria uh, we look at it by student group, which you can see on the color-coded sheet. Um, any student group meeting partial achievement of the end, we believe provides evidence that full achievement of the end has not been accomplished. So what you'll see in the presentation tonight is for certain student groups, we say achieve, sufficient evidence exists toward achievement of the end, and for certain student groups, only partial evidence exists. All right, so that's uh, kind of the lead in, if you remember, um, that was, that's part of the new framework. And then we go through the actual results. So this is how we're interpreting the policy. Again, we're only focusing right now on the one sub end. Now we're gonna get into the results. And then at the end, we'll draw conclusions and share those conclusions uh, with the board, as well as talk about some of the strategies that we're using to achieve the ends and improve the ends. So for each of these parts, I'll take us through the policy interpretation part, and John's gonna take us through the results. Great, thank you. And so uh, jumping right into it, uh, as you know, we do currently have a 93.3% graduation rate for the all student group. Um, that is an extremely high graduation rate when compared to uh, our comparable districts, that's district 6,500 uh, uh, students and larger. Uh, that actually ranks first in on-time graduation rate, and that ranks fourth, uh, uh, we rank fourth in our five-year graduation rate, which is our extended graduation rate. Um, both of those come with significant effort by our schools and district, and uh, um, those are very uh, good numbers, high numbers, but we know that there's uh, additional work, and so we're gonna kinda go through some of the, uh, the exceptions, as we might call them. Um, we know when we look at our data and our student groups that there are gaps present uh, when we look at race, ethnicity, uh, program participation, and students that um, are identified as low income, we do see gaps in both on-time and extended graduation rates. Uh, when looking at uh, our race, race and ethnicity data, um, particularly looking at our uh, black African American students, we see that currently their on-time graduation rate is uh, right around 79%, but when comparing it uh, to those 49 large school districts, we rank 30th. And so that is data that uh, we pay attention to and look at, um, and it causes us to uh, uh, need to know what other districts are doing to, uh, uh, to not have those, uh, those large gaps. Um, we also know that when we're looking at this, uh, we are seeing a slight increase for our black African American students, uh, and we also know that uh, the five-year uh, five-year high at 88.5 percent of the extended graduation rate is an all-time high for that group, but it's also the lowest performing group, and so that's all data that we uh, we know and pay attention to. Um, 
when looking at our students receiving special services, currently have an on-time graduation rate of uh, right around 77%. It's important to note that that ranks third among our uh, comparable districts. With a, they also have an extended graduation rate of around 84%, uh, and that's the five-year graduation rate, and that actually ranks first among di uh, our comparable districts. Um, we know that there's a gap of about 20% for on-time graduation rate and about 15% for the extended graduation rate. And uh, there's been a slight decrease in the gap for on-time graduation rate, but by and large, it's remained uh, consistent over the last five years. Uh, when looking at our students participating in the English Learner uh, Language Program, uh, we see that there's been kind of some inconsistent results in on-time graduation rate uh, with a smaller gap for the extended graduation rate. Um, and we also know that we rank about 18th in our on-time graduation rate. That slide also uh, oh, calls out you. the exited uh, ELL students, which is uh, something that the board has asked for. And that gives us good data in terms of how are students performing once they have exited ELL, which is quite a bit higher than students who are currently in ELL. And it shows that our exited ELL students are um, performing similar to non-ELL peers. And when looking at our uh, low-income students, uh, we see that they have an 85% on-time graduation rate, which ranks about 15. Uh, there, the gap in on-time graduation rate has decreased over the last five years uh, by about nine points, and, but we also see that the extended graduation rate gap has been persistent over the last five years. So uh, we're only a third of the way through. <laughs> we uh, will move on to the next sub and around this big end, which is enrollment in college level coursework in high school. So if you want to follow along on the written report, we're now on page 11. So in terms of uh, interpreting uh, the sub and college level high school coursework is interpreted as dual credit. Courses. So a dual credit course is a rigorous course taught in a college or high school that provides students the potential to earn both high school and college credit. Uh, dual credit programs include advanced placement, uh, Cambridge, um, career and technical education courses that uh, offer dual credit, uh, what used to be called tech prep, uh, college and the high school courses, and running start courses can all result in college credit. Uh, it's important to note that in today's world, two-thirds of all jobs require some post-high school training or education. So taking dual credit, and why we pay attention to dual credit, uh, is because taking dual credit's connected to higher high school graduation rates, college enrollment, and degree completion. So this is an indicator of our preparing students to be college, career, and future ready. So therefore, we're interpreting that students who enroll and demonstrate success in dual credit courses show evidence of future readiness, especially college preparedness. When it gets to the observable conditions and targets, again, we have a high aspirational targets that we have set in that uh, our target is for 95% of 11th and 12th grade students uh, to be enrolled in a dual credit college level course and earn a B or above. We also have a target of 95% of our students taking at least one AP exam and 95% of our students passing an AP exam. When it comes to uh, interpreting sufficient evidence toward achievement of the end and our rationale for that, we're looking for 85% or more students, again, knowing that the 95% aspirational is a multi-year target. Uh, the immediate is for 85% or more students to be enrolled in dual credit and taking and passing at least one AP exam. Uh, and if student performance shows, again, it should say an improving three-year trend, and no more than a 2% point, 
point decline in the three-year trend. Again, these are the business rules. It looks a little clunky on the slide, but it, it's the business rules that we determined um, that informs the color coding data overview sheet. So uh, you can look at it as the green and light green areas are where we're interpreting sufficient evidence toward achievement of the end, and the yellow and red areas where we're interpreting partial achievement. So. I, I kind of uh, just already spoke to this slide, but again, since we're looking at it by student group, that third bullet is really important. We're not just looking at the all student group and saying we're good. <laughs> we're looking at it disaggregated by student group and setting that same target for every single one of our students. So now the monitoring results for enrollment in college level coursework in high school. So when looking at the all student category, uh, we see that 88.5% of students uh, do enroll in dual credit coursework, and that 85% of the students that are enrolled in dual credit coursework receive a B or higher in that class. We also see that 29% uh, of our um, high school students uh, take uh, an AP exam, uh, remembering that AP is one of the ways students earn dual credit. Uh, but we also know that 80% of students that are taking AP exams uh, receive a passing grade, or a passing score, excuse me. Similar to uh, our graduation rates, we do see that gaps persist uh, for dual credit uh, accrual, for uh, race, ethnicity, program participation, and low income. Uh, when digging into the data around uh, race and ethnicity, uh, we see that uh, black African American and Hispanic Latino students have lower participation in dual credit coursework. We also see that over the last five years that there's been increased participation by both black African American and Hispanic Latino students by about 20%. Uh, we know that gaps remain consistent in uh, participation and performance, uh, particularly participation in AP exams, and you can see uh, Performance on AP exams has been similar for our Hispanic Latino students, and you can see kind of a big jump for our black African American students, and then has been relatively consistent over the last three years. When looking at our uh, EL students, uh, you can see that there uh, are pretty consistent gaps in both participation uh, and performance for dual credit, and a consistent gap for uh, AP exam uh, participation. But then when you look at the performance on AP exams, it's actually striking that it was relatively consistent with peers with a decrease in the last year of data there, um, which I don't have a reason why. It's just interesting that for, the, for four years of the data, uh, they actually were performing similar to peers um, for those students that uh, took an AP exam and were EL learners. When looking at our low income students, um, we see that uh, by and large, consistent gaps are present across um, all four of these data slides. We also see that participation has increased uh, in dual credit uh, coursework by about 20 percentage points uh, over the last five years. I think that's extremely positive uh, to point out. And you can see that the gap has um, slightly decreased for dual credit participation. Um, there's been a slight, I, I will use slight, increase in AP uh, participation with uh, a relatively uh, interesting increase in performance by about 10 percentage points over the last five years in AP exam passage rates. Okay, that brings us to our third sub-end, which is enrollment in a post-secondary institution within two years of graduation. So post-secondary enrollment is interpreted, again, if you want to follow along in the written report, we're now on page 17. Post-secondary enrollment is interpreted as enrollment in a two- or four-year public or private technical college, community college, college or university. 
Uh, we know that not all jobs require a college education. However, according to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, unemployment rates are lower and lifetime earnings are higher for college graduates than high school graduates. In addition, college graduates are more likely to receive benefits such as health care from their employer and college also encourages workers to excel in the workplace and gain new knowledge and experience so in general post-secondary education provides more opportunity to for students to experience personal and career success so uh, that's why uh, we are interpreting that students who enroll in a post-secondary institution within two years of graduation show evidence of future readiness. Our observable conditions and targets for this particular sub-end, again, we've got a high aspirational target. If you go to the next slide, uh, and that's for 95% of our graduates to enroll in a post-secondary institution within two years of graduation. Uh, and we, so we track student attendance by college type, as mentioned, two for public, private. And uh, given, if you go to the next slide, that our um, we have that high aspirational goal, like the other uh, sub-ends, uh, we are interpreting evidence toward achievement and progress toward that high aspirational goal as 85% or more students, or 71 to 84% of students within that group uh, if the student performance shows an improving three-year trend. So again, back to the color-coded sheet, often we're looking at performance, rank compared to other districts, and trend, performance trend uh, over time. So. Uh, again, a multi-year effort to reach that 95%. Uh, and given that we're tracking by student group, uh, acknowledging that in any student group not meeting that established 85% criteria or the 71 to 84 with the improving trend uh, is evidence of partial achievement of the end. Okay, so on to the monitoring results. And it's important to point out that when we're looking at enrollment, um, you'll see that there's times where we're referencing enrollment within two years and enrollment within one year. The enrollment within two years, um, that data set actually allows us to look at trends, but it doesn't allow us to rank where the data within one year allows us to rank, but it doesn't show us trends. And so that's why we go back and forth, um, and it's data that we can consistently pull in that manner, and so that's why we're using uh, those data. And just real quick, thanks, John, for pointing that out. On the data overview sheet, uh, you'll see two rows, one for year one that shows rank, and then the next one for uh, within two years that shows the trend and the percentage. Yes. Go. Great. <laughs> and so uh, you can see here that uh, we do have uh, post secondary enrollment of 83.7 for the all student group um, within uh, two years. Uh, that's actually an increase over the last uh, few years, and so that is a positive trend. Uh, we actually rank third uh, in overall enrollment uh, within one year of, uh, of graduation. And so uh, we see that as both of those data points as positive. Um, we do see some gaps um, uh, consistently with, uh, with enrollment in post-secondary for race, ethnicity, program participation, um, and low income, but there also are some positive uh, data points in, in, uh, in these data as well. And so when we're looking at our uh, race ethnicity, really there's, um, we have a three year data set here and the data is inconsistent with enrollment, but we can see consistently that our black African American and Hispanic Latino students have a lower post-secondary enrollment than the other race ethnicity uh, groups. And so uh, that's data to be uh, mindful of. When looking at our uh, students receiving special education, uh, you can see that there's been a positive trend over the last three years with the last data point uh, having 67.7% of students uh, enrolled in post-secondary education within two years 
We also know that uh, our district ranks first uh, in, uh, with our comparable districts of post-secondary enrollment within one year of graduation. And so uh, while we rank one, and we know that within two years, uh, we have almost 70% of our students uh, identified as special education enrolling, uh, we still wanna see that, uh, that enrollment percent increasing. For our uh, English language learners, again, uh, there's some inconsistent enrollment for our uh, students that are graduating uh, that are still indicated as English language learners. Uh, kind of the consistent data here is between our uh, non-ELL and our exited ELL. You can see that there's been uh, kind of a consistent gap over the last three years with that gap closing as well, uh, or reducing over the last three years as well. And for our low-income students, um, while there's been increased enrollment uh, over the last three years, the gap has remained uh, extremely consistent. Okay, so that is uh, the interpretation, rationale, alignment to ends, and monitoring results for the three sub-ends. And then we've developed one conclusion for the entire ER um, for consideration of the board that could inform a potential motion for the board. So that conclusion is that we have sufficient evidence of achievement of the end for the all students group, and we have partial evidence of achievement of the end for identified student groups. Again, you could reference the data overview sheet to identify which student groups were um, identifying as the identified student groups. So reasonable, we believe that reasonable interpretation uh, does include observable conditions, targets, and rationale that align with the ENDS policy and represents appropriate targets for outcomes given our high aspirational targets. And while sufficient evidence exists to demonstrate that the sub-ENDS, one, two, and three, uh, that we just went through of the larger ENDS policy, that um, they have been achieved for the all students group and for some student groups, depending on the, the particular um, aspect of the, of the end, uh, evidence demonstrates only partial, reasonable partial achievement for other student identified groups. So an, you know, an easier way for the board to think about it is the, the green, <laughs> the color coded sheet, green would be the um, where we believe sufficient evidence exists and it's the yellow and red shaded uh, areas where only partial achievement exists. So the final part, in addition to the conclusion just shared, is a brief uh, opportunity for us to talk a little bit about some strategies to achieve the ends. And uh, I want to point out that the program reports that we do throughout the year are really, um, whether it's part of an actual executive limitation board policy or we address it in a program report. Um, that's been our attempt to highlight on an ongoing basis the means that we are striving toward to accomplish ultimately ends and ultimately this big end. So if you want to turn to page 21, bless you, of the written report, 21 and 22 provide some additional uh, information about uh, what we're doing currently and uh, what is being planned evaluated. So I'll just highlight kind of the high bullet points and then you can look um, for more specifics in the written report. But our uh, building continuous improvement process, uh, aligning that process to our end result process is something that we continue to work on. The data displays, the dashboard that is now um, for the board is also for principals, so they can be looking at that same data and setting those same goals for students. And our director of school support helps support our principals in that data analysis, as do uh, a number of our other program directors. Um, our high school and beyond plan and transition plan efforts are designed to ensure that every student is uh, being supported in developing an intentional plan for post high school. Uh, we have uh, college bound students. Those are students who are identified as a, in a cohort 
as eligible for the college bound scholarship. They're identified in middle school and there's work being done with those students as a cohort all throughout uh, their uh, middle and high school to ensure that they are um, following through <laughs> on that uh, commitment that they made in uh, middle school. You know, we uh, are working on implementing for next year. We're planning the implementation of a seven period high school schedule that will allow students uh, more um, opportunity for remediation, enrichment, and acceleration. And uh, we have a new 18 to 21 transition program. In terms of what's being planned or an evaluation phase, uh, it's, it's showing up in both places, but we are planning for that high school, the seven period high school schedule. We're planning for it this year to be implemented next year. Uh, we still have the work happening around school start times uh, and the uh, evaluation of a potential additional 18 to 21 transition program. So those just some of the things we wanted to highlight more specifics in the written report. So that's our new format. <laughs> that's our new presentation. And uh, thanks, John. And I'll back will. over to you. Thank you. And I will open that up for discussion. Thank you, John. Any comments, questions? Yeah, my comment. Uh, Tracy, John, excellent. Everyone who worked on that was really good. Um, very impressive that you were able to turn around Thank in you. such a short amount of time since our extended study session a uh, tremendous presentation. Um, Thank you. Putting into effect all the all that we discussed. So I, re I really appreciate it. It was excellent. Thank you, Eric. I concur. Um, the uh, I, I'm really enjoying some of these trends and the breakouts. The, the, every time I see the samples, the, the, the students broken out by never ELL versus exited versus currently in ELL, it blows my mind. Um, these kids who have been through, if I understand it correctly, ELL is three years. It, that's how long it lasts. And yet, they're performing just like their peers who spoke English to begin with, which is extraordinary. Um, I'm not too worried about the ELL pass rate on AP exams. Um, if you're still taking ELL and you're trying to take an AP, um, that's fantastic, but I'm not worried about whether you get a three or better. Um, other than that, the, uh, the trends for low income were actually, particularly in the four-year graduation rate, were positive. I mean, we, we're bumping up against the ceiling for the non-low-income kids, 95% plus, which is great, but uh, the, the, that is a very positive trend over the last five years that we're pushing um, from 75, less than 75 to almost 85% for the low-income kids. I definitely want to see that continue, and I'm, I'm proud of you guys. Whatever we're doing, we're doing some things right, and uh, let's keep finding ways to improve. Um, I didn't have anything that particularly concerned me. I do, you're, you're uh, sorry, there's one slide where uh, when I dug into the actual numbers beneath it, you had N less than 10. Again, this is just getting back to the ELL AP courses. When you tell me that 85.7% of N less than or equal 10 to 10 kids passed an AP course, you've just told me that six out of seven kids who took an AP course test passed it. When you tell me that 66.7 of less than 10, you tell, you've just told me that either six out of nine or four out of six, because we don't report below five. Um, anyway, you, you can keep going. So the 33.3, nothing to worry about. That's, that's the difference between three out of nine and six out of nine, which is, that's which kids showed up to take the test what day. Mm -hmm. So um, that particular trend, I have no concern over whatsoever. Um, anyway, um, I, overall, I am very impressed. I'm as I said, echoing Eric's comments. Having talked about it, I knew this could be useful. Watching it done, done quickly and done quite well, is really impressive. This is the most useful report I've had in a decade on the board. So thank you. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Go at the next football. 
Director Sage, you look like you have a comment. I, uh, I just, I am also impressed with the amount of data and the way in which you presented it. I think this is how we look at some of those gaps and try and figure out, ah, what is the missing piece here? So I agree. It's a very impressive presentation. I have a quick question. In the very um, slight number of kids who happen to drop out, uh, somewhere, page 21 is written, high schools receive monthly progress updates regarding student dropouts. And I'm just curious, how do you, how do you get that information? Mm -hmm. So uh, we have what's called, um, and you're referring to, uh, just for everybody's benefit, page, page 22 under the continuous improvement process, the third bullet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have what we, uh, what's called a P223. P223, is that the right? Okay. That's good to me. <laughs> a data system um, that allows us to track uh, students and uh, if, and um, John, you can help me out here. F fine. Well, and I'm just, I'm having a hard time ex ex explaining it, but the P223, so our data people, and I should give, we should give uh, big kudos to Tim yeah. Krieger, who's our director of research evaluation um, and data, who, as you know, has done all of the data work in terms of putting the data into uh, Power BI, into the board dashboard that you all have access it's to. It's impressive. And uh, what that allows us to do is really focus on the interpretation part and and um, just be able to really uh, copy paste or you know all I had to do is like put it into you know PowerPoint um, from the data system so it's made the data displays um, uh, it's taken a lot of the it, it's it, exactly exactly so I just want to give a, a big shout out to, to Tim and, and his work on that uh, back to your question so uh, the P223 is where we can see um, and track if students are not in our system and going to another system. <laughs> because mm -hmm. what, um, based on that definition of graduate, that graduating right. class is established at ninth grade and if the student stops attending here and isn't enrolled in another place, then that student is in that dropout category. Um, we've, over the course of the past several years, really instituted some uh, in assurances that everyone in the system is paying attention to uh, student by student uh, what's happening with our students so we can do outreach if we have students who are non attending. Do you want to add to that? And so, uh, over the last, I would say, four years, we've taken that report and tried to make meaning of it. Um, almost by using pencils and highlighters. Um, we did some data merging, trying to make meaning of it. Um, Tim has now, he takes that data on a monthly basis, um, puts it in Power BI for principals to be able to have access to their data uh, around students who are identified in quote unquote negative status. And there's a variety of reasons why you can be negative status. You've dropped out of school and we need to re-engage, get you back into school, you know, whatever's the right fit for you, figure that out. Other students, there's times they've transferred, but the data systems aren't talking to one another. We wanna make sure that we have clean data as well. And so we have, um, Tim does that on a monthly basis. It's actually, that report gets updated um, in real time almost every night. And so Tim takes that snapshot on a monthly basis, pushes it out to DSS and principals so that they have the updated data uh, and so that they're making sure that they're following through with both data and re-engagement. And uh, it's, it's schools, it's Tim, it's also our data processing <laughs> team because they're the ones that if a school says, no, this isn't a student that's in negative status, they moved the data processing team helps track down where that student went to make sure that the other data system is talking to our data system so that student is no longer in negative status. Um, Great. And we have very few students that truly drop out. Um, and what we found is anytime a student drops out, many adults know them and uh, re-engagement efforts or engagement efforts before they dropped out have already been uh, relatively thorough, but this is just that reminder to make sure that we're continually trying to re-engage students. Great, thank you very much. I know it's a small amount of students. I was just fascinated at the ability to um, 
be able to reach out to them and re-engage. So that's good news. Thank you. Uh, how does that data uh, track perhaps kids that are all, the parents have decided to homeschool? Is that, is that trackable or not? Uh, I, I'm assuming that must be very difficult. To yeah, work, right? so if a, if a parent wants to uh, homeschool, they have to complete a declaration of intent to hold them school mm -hmm. form, and that gets filed here um, at the district and is tracked. So uh, if you're a homeschool student, then you're that's that's you're not included in that data set okay. because you're not in our system. You're homeschooled. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Nothing. Um, I'd just like to take a moment to thank you for the report as well. Um, it was impressive to be able to see the trends across the board, um, shows the additional work that's gone in to really focus on those things, and to see it fairly consistently across multiple subgroups. Um, so we were gaining ground across the board, so that was really good to see, and it was good to see the complete comprehensive set of strategies and what's going forward. So thank you in creating that capacity to be able to see so. Um, and sort of summarizing what I'm hearing tonight, it sounds like everybody is in agreement with um, reasonable progress being made on the ends result at this point in time and, and in the format of which this is laid out. Is that true? All right. Then with that, I will entertain a motion. Move approval. I would like to try to entertain a motion that has the structure we were provided so that oh, we can get it documented God. in the way we need it. Sorry, I should have dropped that to you first. Huh? I'm 15 minutes from turning into a pumpkin. I know. I move approval of th accepting the assertion of progress in ER1 report. Did I get Do close? Just to put or the conclusion up? No, it's, it's, okay. Yeah, could you put it back up again? Yeah. I'll, I'll just... John, would you mind putting the conclusion slide back up? Yep. Thank you. Uh, uh, no need. Um, so I, I move to approve the superintendent's monitoring report on ends result one, which is our mission and vision, uh, dated. Well, I don't actually remember the date of the ex, the report itself. It'd be today. As presented today, uh, recognizing that the information is aligned with the ends policy and represents appropriate targets for outcomes. Further, this monitoring report demonstrates that while there was not full achievement of the ends policy interpretation, the board believes that the evidence demonstrates reasonable partial achievement towards the end policy interpretation. And again, we commend all the work of staff on this. Thank you. Second. Any discussion? Okay, so we have a motion that has been proposed by Director La Liberty and seconded by Dr. Carlson to, I'm gonna shorten it, approve the ends result with reasonable interpretation with partial achievement in certain areas. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Excellent, thank you. Great, We thank can, you. so. Thank you. I appreciate all the work with that. Thank you. We can So do we need a motion to so punt those to the next a, agenda? Yes, so in looking at the agenda and the time, we do have two program reports that are on there, and we are looking at the possibility of moving those to our next meeting. Oh, we're on a roll. And Let's the second report as well. Okay. We're on a roll. Are we okay with that if we move those to the next meeting? Okay, so because now we will hit the last item on the non-consent agenda, which is the superintendent search process. Um, and so, yeah. So, do you want to just do you want to? Well, there is a situation that? recommendation that might be. Bent. I think it would be beneficial. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, tab twelve is the situation recommendation, and as the board knows and the community knows, on uh, April tenth, uh, I announced my plans to step out of the role of superintendent and into the role of director of college career readiness. Uh, we have a retirement on the team, and I'm stepping into that role. Uh, 
in this new role, I'll be able to focus. It's actually really exciting when you think about the ENDS result report that, uh, that we just did. Um, I'm excited that I'll be able to focus all my uh, time and energy in really helping ensure our students meet our uh, vision of every student future ready. Uh, and so in this role, uh, this, uh, the director's responsible for engaging students in career and technical education, uh, WANIC program development and coursework, and in building opportunities for internships and externships for students, and continuing to cultivate relationships with our community and business partners to benefit district students. So um, I'm, I'm, as you know, I'm excited about this uh, decision. I shared the decision with the central leadership team and the district leadership team. Uh, last week, I've been humbled and uh, honored uh, to serve in this role and really humbled and honored by um, the incredible amount of uh, email, uh, supporting emails from uh, colleagues and, and parents uh, in terms of just recognizing me for my service. And so that's been really humbling too. Uh, on uh, April 11th, the board announced that uh, they're going to be, you will be initiating a national open search uh, with the support of a consulting firm experienced in identifying and recruiting leaders for high performing school districts such as ours and uh, both internal and external candidates will be considered. So uh, recognizing the importance to students, parents, staff and communities as well as the future of the district in selecting a new superintendent, uh, the board has uh, stated they will seek input from the community throughout the process and develop a search timeline and provide opportunities for community involvement uh, in multiple ways. So the recommendation tonight is for the board to provide an update on the superintendent search process for the community. Okay. So first off, thank you for your time as superintendent. We will have much more conversation. There's still much work to be done. Um, but in that time frame, we are now at the position where we will be looking for a new superintendent to fill this position. So we have been in the process of holding that discussion of figuring out what those next steps are. Um, and that is that national search uh, piece. And so I will entertain a motion. Yeah, I, I move that the board uh, hire a national search firm to assist in the search process, including developing a community engagement process assisting the board in developing a community engagement process and identifying and recruiting candidates. Second. It has been moved by Director La Liberty and seconded by Director Sage. <laughs> it has been a very long yeah. day. Um, that we hire a national search firm going forward. All those in favor? Actually, I should ask for any discussion at that point. I apologize, go forward. Any qu discussion? I just wanted to say a thank you to the team. This has been, I've spent more time on the phone this week than I do in a usual month, and I know I've spent much less time on the phone than you have, Siri. So thank you for helping us and leading us into the beginning of this process. So I'm proud of us so far, and uh, I'm excited about the next step. I second what Chris said. <laughs> All right, any further discussion? Okay, so then for the motion on the table, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, then the motion carries. We will move forward with hiring a search firm and going out for that. Any other questions? So we are still in the process and there'll be more information coming out as we learn more as we go through this as well. Anything else? No. Okay. We have decided that we will move the program report, which was on world language and mission and vision college and career readiness, as well as our soup report, which was on health services. We will move that to our next meeting um, in order to expedite this a little bit more. And so we will then move to any legislative update. Right, so um, WASDA is in the process of forming its legislative priorities right now. And it's important that we, as a as one of the larger districts in the state participate in that and that we determine our own policies. So I, our priorities, thank you. Uh, so I would hope that we can work that into our work plan in the next, um, in the coming months so that we can engage robustly in that process. Cause I, I it's important that 
WASA does a lot of great work, but it's important that our voice is heard. Do you have a timeline as to when that would? Yeah. Or at least if you can provide that, then we can I make can. sure to I, build I, I that don't in. Wanna, I don't want to. <laughs> okay. I don't want to get it wrong. So let me let me circulate that to the board. And so is everybody in agreement that we go ahead and build that into the agenda, into the work plan going forward so we can do those priorities? In the past, we have done it with a committee of two of us um, working with Dr. Pierce and Janine is who it was the last time she's retired. I guess it would be Dr. Holman at this point. I'm in um, favor of efficiency and uh, I think a fair number of our points, I, I mean, were multi-year objectives. So it's more of an edit rather than a draft, well, I, I hope. Well, uh, I, I see Director Carlson's face when we were discussing having this in the work plan. Um, but I, <laughs> I, um, I would like the whole board to be a part of it. And my take is I think the whole board should be a part of this rather than a, a committee. I think there's an educational piece for the board too and understand and, and making sure that we're all on the same page. So there's an agreement to set that up as a work session then as we go through and look at that? I mean, that's what it sounds like it would have to be. As long as it's sufficient. Yeah, it, it doesn't have to be a full work session. We okay. We work it into one. Okay. As long as I just know how we're putting into the work plan. Does that make sense? Okay. So the next thing is any follow-up for the board? Any other future agenda items? We have a legislative priority. We have EL3, which will be working through in that as well. All right, any debrief or board member comments? Then I think I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Oh, sorry, before I can, next board meeting. May 7th, 5 p.m. we have a study session on facility planning and at 7 p.m. will be a board meeting here in the board room. So with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay, second. Second. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Moved by <laughs> Director Carlson and seconded by Director La Liberty. <laughs> the meeting is adjourned. All those, do I have to say all those in favor? Yeah, sure. Aye. Aye. All those opposed? None. Motion carries. We're adjourned.